Hi, welcome to the Israel First television program from our studios in Jerusalem, welcoming you wherever you're uh, watching in the world. And uh, today in the news, with a program that looks at the news from Israel and have features from Israel and guests from Israel, uh, this is uh, the Guardian newspaper and it says hundreds of Marines uh, are going into Syria, this is hot off the press, to support the war against ISIS. So uh, in the studio today to talk about this and a lot of other things, we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Mordecai Kedar. Thank you so much for coming in today. We, pleasure. We welcome you and um, thank you for giving us your time. Uh, Dr. Mordecai Kedar is a senior lecturer at Bar Ilan University in the Department of Arabic. He's served 25 years with Israeli Army Military Intelligence, specializing in Islamic groups, the political discourse of Arab countries, and the Arab uh, media. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Israeli Army Reserves and is familiar with the um, Arab media uh, and has been interviewed on various news programs in Israel as uh, Edmund Sanders of the Los Angeles Times calls him one of the few Arabic speaking Israeli pundits seen on Arabic satellite channels. So if you've watched, uh, if you are watching the Arabic channels and you watch Al Jazeera, you may have seen him speaking there. He's spoken at the United States House of Representatives, BBC News, Al Jazeera, France 24, Russia Today, I24 News, and many others, I guess. So thank you uh, so much for coming in today. So maybe if we could just start off with that, what, what your thoughts are. Uh, some people say that this is the end of ISIS and uh, others are saying that it will re-emerge as a separate beast um, and the Americans are going in. What, what, what are your kind of thoughts on, on what's happening at the moment? Well, uh, we have to define between two things. One is sending troops to Syria, Iraq. This is essential because you cannot get rid of such a state like the Islamic State by air strikes or air, air, air raids, it doesn't work. You have to go wherever they hide in, in cellars, in rooms, wherever they are, which you don't see them from the air, and you have to catch them and to put them where they have to be put, either behind the bars or uh, in the ground. Uh, this is why sending the troops is not surprising, because apparently the United States uh, decided to do something uh, rather than talk or bomb from the air. There's been a quite a lot of uh, discussion about not putting boots on the ground. And do you think it's a change of policy? Or? <laughs> Definitely a change of policy with the change of the administration. No, no doubt. This is one thing. The second, the second thing, what will be with the ISIS? Uh, we, I, I'm not a prophet, so I know what will be in the future. But what we saw from the past, from the near past, is what happened with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was toppled as an organization in Afghanistan after the war which started in the end of 2001, which was after the September 11 uh, uh, attacks on America. So Al-Qaeda was defeated as an organization, but moved to all, all kinds of places because people ran away, not to become lawyers or accountants. They ran away in order to become jihadists. So we have, instead of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, we then uh, got Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Libya, in Morocco, in Algeria. Even some went to Nigeria and they actually gathered with uh, Boko Haram, the local uh, jihadists. So um, what you say is like, like, like a mercury of a thermometer which falls and breaks and every part of the mercury becomes a whole ball somewhere else. And this is exactly what happened with Al-Qaeda. And uh, by the way, some of them went to Sinai and they later became the Sinai district of the Islamic State. So what I'm saying is that these jihadist organizations, when they are toppled as a state or a centric organization, they became franchise in many places. And in my view, it's already happening with the Islamic State because we already saw their representatives in France, what they did uh, some, some terrorist attacks in, in Paris. If you remember the November 2015 in, uh, in the uh, nightclub, the Bataclan and the stadium, uh, they, we saw them in the Hypercacher. We saw them in many places. In Belgium, we saw them. We saw them in, 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 in <laughs> almost every country which they go. They go in order to spread terror, and we definitely see them. So this is actually what will happen 
with those remnants of the Islamic State which will remain if they are not killed or put in a jail like Guantanamo Bay. So this is, uh, I would say, another phase of what happened with Al-Qaeda now will happen with the Islamic State. So we could even see it forming as even a different name or in a different type of... Um... Different fr franchise. Wow. Now, uh, one of the uh, uh, news stories that we've been uh, looking at uh, uh, on the program is the potential of the move of the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv, where it is currently, to be based in Jerusalem, and then looking at some of the comments of the Palestinians and and the, uh, the PLO about what that could, the repercussions of that. It's not so, only also the Jordanians and many others. Look, I think that the not only the American embassy, all the, the embassies which are in Tel Aviv should move to Jerusalem. Why? It will, moving the, the embassies will mean to our neighbors, who many of them don't want to see us at all, that the whole world is actually behind Israel. The whole world recognizes the Jewish history in Jerusalem, which we are there since the king of King David moved his capital from Hebron to Jerusalem, King Solomon, and all the kings after him, even Jesus Christ was in Jerusalem. So, and he, he was born a Jew, as you know. So, uh, this actually, by moving the embassies to Jerusalem, it will mean that the whole world recognizes the Jewish history and the Jewish uh, uh, right to be in Jerusalem. And after all, Jerusalem is the oldest capital in the whole world. There is not even one city which is older than Jerusalem, capital city, which is older than Jerusalem. So, since the whole world will recognize Jerusalem as the city of the Jews, and this actually will give Israel much more legitimacy and power, this will convince our neighbors that Israel is there forever because the whole world is behind it. And they would rather give peace to Israel rather than trying to get us uh, 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 all the way from the uh, map. And how do I know this? The Palestinians, they actually show it by themselves. Look at this. They go around with these scarves uh, which they produce. And this is by the PLO. It's not even Hamas. Hamas. You can see uh, this, the flag of the PLO. And they say it here, Al-Quds Lana. Jerusalem is ours. Since when Jerusalem was theirs. But never mind, they claim Jerusalem is ours. But on the other side, they show Palestine. Palestine means there is no Israel in their view. And they know, the, and they know the connection because, and this is why it's connected. If they have Jerusalem, they think they will have the whole Palestine. Means there will be no Israel. So by moving the embassies to Jerusalem, the whole world actually tells the, the neighbors, forget it, forget it. Israel is there because we, the whole world, support the existence of Israel and the right of the Jews to Jerusalem. And you better give Israel peace, otherwise you have a problem with us. And this is what will bring peace. Because in the, in the Middle East, peace is given not to somebody who crawls and begs for peace. Peace in the Middle East is given only to the one who is invincible and succeeds to, con to convince his neighbors and foes and enemies that for their own good they should leave him alone. This is peace in the Middle East. It's not like in Europe. It's not like in the United States. Here peace is something like truce or ceasefire or non-belligerence document. Okay, this is peace in the Middle East, in the concepts of, of the culture of the Middle East. And we have to fit our expectations to what is possible in the Middle East because the market of peace in the Middle East has no, mer has no merchandise which looks like peace in... Uh, 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 Europe or in the United States, hugs and kisses. There is no hugs and no kisses in the Middle East. This is why moving the embassies actually will increase the chances for peace. Now, uh, one of the uh, comments has been that it could uh, cause an intifada or violence. Do, do you think that's... On uh, the contrary. Once the Palestinians understand that their fight is over, means they failed because all the embassies are in Jerusalem, they will try to come to terms with Israel. After all, Israel is invincible. Now, one of the things that's happening at the moment is the um, 
the visit of uh, Netanyahu, the prime minister, to, to Russia to see Put, uh, Putin. Uh, Putin. And um, of course, there's the discussions of what's happening in Syria and Iran. Um, do, you, do you think that's a, a major issue, the Iranian involvement in, in Syria? And um, Look, the Middle East actually becomes today, a, or at least the northern part, I'm talking about Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, the sequence, which is from one side Iran, and the other side is the Mediterranean Sea. Iran tries to turn all these sequence uh, of lands, Iraq, Syria and Lebanon into an Iranian-led countries, because if they succeed to do it, uh, they actually have access to the sea, to the Mediterranean Sea, and and they actually engulf Saudi Arabia from the north. They also try to engulf or surround uh, 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 Saudi Arabia from the south by from Yemen, uh, actually like a grip, which will crash the Sunnis. That's what the Shia uh, here prepare. However, Russia in Syria is some kind of an obstacle. So there is some kind of uh, issues between, between, between uh, Russia and Iran about Syria, about the future of Syria. Yet they still cooperate on preserving Assad and resuscitating the Assad regime and fighting the others. Uh, what will be the day after? Nobody really knows, but uh, then the fight will, will start maybe between Iran and Russia as well. However, uh, uh, Netanyahu goes to Russia in order to make sure that Russia doesn't give weapons or develop weapons to Hezbollah. And, uh, and, and Russia actually controls Syria to make sure that Hezbollah doesn't use the, the Syrian soil in order to launch missiles to Israel. Because we may know what happened to do, what, what happens, what, whatever is what should we do in, uh, in Lebanon, but we don't want to open another front in Syria against Hezbollah in Syria. So maybe this is the issues which Netanyahu wants to uh, discuss with Putin. And, and the, the problem is, is that Hezbollah have been active in the war in Syria and are sort of becoming a bit battle-hardened. They're, they're getting used to the fight and this is not really that good a situation on Israel's uh, border for, uh, for the... Well, uh, Hassan Nasrallah declared, declared, declared in every speech which he talks and he relates to the Hezbollah involvement in Syria, he says that we are fighting in Syria for the uh, survival of Lebanon. This is what he says. And this is as, as weird as it is, he, he, he means it. Because he, he knows that if he fails in Syria, the jihadists who will topple Assad will come to topple him again uh, as well in, in, in Lebanon. So he fights in Syria in order to save the connection between his head and shoulders in Lebanon. Uh, yet, the, the question is what Israel should do with this. I think that maybe this is another issue which uh, Netanyahu wants to discuss with Putin, not to allow Hezbollah turn Syria into an, an, an extent of uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, we don't uh, hesitate to hit whatever we think uh, it's, it's some kind of a legitimate target. And today, the Hezbollah targets, even in Syria, are legitimate. Now, uh, one of the issues is that uh, with Trump coming to power, and we talked about that, is the issue of Iran and nuclear power. Um, you, that uh, there was the big agreement, and uh, Israel was very upset about this agreement that Obama made with um, uh, uh, the with, Ira with the Iranians. Now, what do you think about that? Is that some people are saying and I, I've seen it in the news today as we've come into the studio that um, uh, Trump is, is not going to change immediately this agreement, and, uh, which is just, a, is it allowing them to do something or it, Look, is it ju just a worthless paper? Uh, Trump can claim that uh, the Iranians actually do not fulfill what they have to do in the, in the agreement. He, he can find his way out if he wants. But the problem is that the United States of America is not the only signatory from the other side. They are also Britain and France and Russia and China and Germany. So if America withdraws from this agreement, so all the jobs and all the money which Iran will spend uh, in order to buy merchandise in these countries will not go to America, will go to Europe. Inst means inst instead of buying Boeing 
airplanes, they will buy Airbus from Europe. So what did Trump uh, gain with this? That he actually makes some kind of a boycott on America. Because, and, and he wants to bring jobs back to America, to, to bring work. This is why, by the way, he was uh, elected. So what now, if he, if he uh, uh, withdraws from, from Iran, it will come on the expense of jobs because it gives big jobs to many Americans. So boycotting Iran and, and, and withdrawing from the agreement actually will jeopardize those workplaces. So it, he is in some kind of contradiction and I still don't know what he will do at the end of the day. And we're, uh, we've got this, the situation, of course, in the north with uh, Hezbollah, but also in the south we have still some people would say they're much diminished and uh, not in the same state they used to be. We've got the Hamas threat uh, with the tunnels and with the missiles. Do you, do you think that's uh, still a major threat to Israel or have they been severely, uh, that, that's been severely disrupted now? It's not a threat to Israel because terror is a nuisance. It's not a threat, existential threat, honestly. Terror, of course, it's agonizing, you know, they kill people, they injure people, they can hurt the infrastructure, they can hurt all kinds of things. We they actually closed the uh, uh, Ben-Gurion airport for a day during the last operation in Gaza by the missiles. It definitely, it, it is not good to live under threats of terror. Yet, terror has not yet toppled a state. And we have to bear it in mind because Terror is not a strategic threat on a state. Only if the state becomes panic and uh, falls into dysfunctionality because of the panic, this is something else. But uh, usually, a, a terror is not, it, it's a nuisance which you pay price for, you know, for, for suffering it. But uh, definitely, uh, you cannot topple a state with this. Uh, Hezbollah is a threat because Hezbollah is a stockpile of who knows how many thousands of missiles. And they actually like an army. There's, there's no, this is not an organization, Hezbollah, anymore. Um, don't forget that even the Lebanese army today is controlled by Hezbollah. And Hassan Nasrallah, although he doesn't have an official position in Lebanon, he is the most powerful person in this country. So definitely we have to close the problems with Hezbollah um, if we want to live in this uh, area. And in my view, the only way how to stop the problems with Hezbollah is to deter them. It means to send them once in a while a message, guys, if you try to mess with us, it's the end of you. Real uh, end. No, I think a lot of our viewers will be very interested to, to know, uh, Mordecai, um, that you, you also speak on the, in the Arab media, on uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, how is that? I mean, um, uh, uh, we can't imagine that uh, Al Jazeera would want to hear really Israel's point of view. Do they give you much opportunity no, to speak? On the contrary, uh, the, the chief, I would say, mastermind of Al Jazeera, a man named Jamal Rayan, who is also the main broadcaster, uh, he admitted, and it's, uh, we can watch it online, he admitted that whenever he interviews an Israeli, he uses as a prey. He uses the Israeli in order to pray him on air. This is what he says in his own words. You can, you can see it uh, online, it's on YouTube. And uh, yeah, he says it whenever. So we invite Israelis not because we love them, but because we hate them. And we want to abuse them on, on air. And so, do they give you a chance to speak or uh, they, they interrupt you or you've gotten... Um... No, when they ask you questions, they want, they want you to stutter an answer. Uh, yet they don't expect you to say answers which they cannot face, like what I usually tell them. And uh, I, I, I'll tell you a good, good example. Uh, once uh, they asked me if, w what's my uh, uh, idea about the right of return of the Palestinian refugees who are not originally Palestinian, never mind. They want to come to Israel because if Israel opens the borders, half of the Arab world will be here within one day. So they asked me, what do I, how, do I support the right of return of, or not? So I said, you, sure, of course. I support the right of return of the Masri, the, the Palestinians which are called Masri, to Egypt. Because Masri means in Arabic, the Egyptian. I support the return of the Horanis to Syria, because the Horan is in Syria. 
I support the return of everyone to the countries which they came originally from to Israel in the days of the, of the British mandate. Do you think many people, many of our viewers will be aware of that, that pal the Palestinians uh, it, it are from so many different countries, they're not, they're not actually, uh, they came here maybe for work, or, but they're not, yeah, right, they're not right. from this area. Uh, yeah, definitely. But uh, the world doesn't, uh, first of all, the world doesn't know it. It's not aware of it. So, so that the whole Palestinian people is an invasion of the 20th century. Uh, secondly, the world doesn't like to look backwards. The, we all like, especially the West, want, wants to look to the front, to see the future. Stop, don't talk to me about the past, because the past is problematic to everybody. So they want to see the future. If there are some people who define themselves as Palestinians, why should we argue with them? Of, of course, uh, because the problem is here. While the Europeans are in Europe, if they had to uh, give the, those foreigners uh, uh, their homes, so it might, might uh, talk in a different uh, style. However, uh, we here, in order to stay in, on our forefathers' land and to flourish, and yet, don't forget that 20% of, of the Israeli population are Arabs. Most of them are Muslims, and they are honored. Um, they are, uh, you know, they live their life in Israel, and they don't live anywhere. And believe me, if they had bad life in Israel, they would go away in no time, because the Israeli passport actually opens all the gates in the world in front of them. So this is why I think that uh, Israel is okay with them. If, and if they don't uh, like it, uh, tough on them. Now, uh, talking about uh, the, the Arabs and Islam, do you think there's a, an issue uh, with um, the West understanding Islam as we come to the end of the program, that they're no, not, no. not, people don't aware that, that of the of jihad and uh, Sharia law and how it works? People relate to Islam as if it's a religion parallel to Christianity and Judaism and many others. The, and this is wrong, because Islam in its own view is a religion which came to the world to replace Judaism and Christianity, to take their lands, to settle in their lands. And uh, this is actually what they do today in Europe. This is what they do. They take Europe over, no doubt. And uh, it seems to be that um, a lot of people don't understand that jihad is a, it's not just um, for the men, but you, you actually did a conference where you said that there was a, that women, the women are also involved in, in jihad. Everybody is involved in the jihad, even a child, even a woman, not to mention men who can do the job. Uh, and jihad is against the enemy, the men, the women, the, the children, uh, because they are all part of the problem. Because if, how can a, a fighter fight if he doesn't have his family? Uh, in his back. Also, when you see the, the families here, uh, yes, this is the, how, how it works. Thank you so much for joining us my today. Pleasure, Great God. to have you with us, and uh, we really appreciate your expert you. views uh, on um, what's happening with our Arab neighbors and also uh, with Islam. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week on Israel First television program. Shalom, wonderful to be with you today. We are looking at the 19th letter of the Aleph Bet today, and the letter is Kuf, and is like the sound is like koala, and this numerical value is 100, and it represents also holiness and also cycle, like the name Kadosh, which means holy. And like we can see in Leviticus 19:2, when God said, Be holy as I am holy. So our sanctity depends on our willingness to put our life under the leadership of our Creator. And His holiness means to be set apart. Now we can see also that just with the change of a letter, Kuf can become Kof, which means monkey. So we can see that holiness sometimes can be twisted. And we know the story, for example, of Sapphira and Ananias who just were buying a field, but were like wanted to keep some for them, and they were trying to imitate Barnabas, who was doing it willingly to help to build the kingdom. 
So calf represents also, we say, cycle, like the name Akafa, and it's to show that God gave us a cycle in the season. God gave a cycle in the universe, like you have the 28th cycle of the sun, you have the cycle of the moon, and this teaches that there is pattern and there is season in the universe. Now we wanted to look also at the name Korban. We start also with a calf. So the name Korban comes from Karov, which means to come close or be near something. So Korban was um, about the offering on the temple. So it wasn't to appease a God who wasn't happy. No, it was for the people to come close to God and to say, hey, you know what? I want to be close to you. So Korban was the main the main name for offering. We can see also the letter, do you remember? There is shape and the, ca the calf is like a calf, is, is like a calf letter and a noon sofit. And the noon sofit is 50 and the calf is 20, which means 70. Again, we can see that during Sukkot, during the Feast of Tabernacle, the Jewish people with, were bringing 70 bulls as an offering for the nations to bless the nations. So the Jewish people have always been uh, like a tool in the hands of God to, bl to be blessed, to bless God, but also to bless the nations. So we look at four names today. We look at Korban, which means offering. We looked at Karov, which means to be close. And we look also at the name uh, Kadosh, which means holy. And the last things, we look at Kof, which means also a monkey. So this is wonderful to be able to learn this alphabet with you, know a bit more about the Hebrew letters, and we'll see you next week again. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, uh, segment that we do for the Israel First television program. Don't forget, we love to hear from you. You can email us at info at israelfirst.org. Visit the website www.israelfirst.org. And don't forget, we're the program that looks at the land, the people, and the language. Mm -hmm.